Okay, good evening, everyone. And we are holding over here in a new class special for the month of Elul and Yom Narayim. And it's called the essence of tshuva. Since that the essence of the day, Rosh Hashanah, Sesame, tshuva, Yom Kippur itself is all about Klal Yisrael coming before Hashem and repenting. So we might as well know what it is exactly, or at least as much as we can, might as well know what we're doing on those days. I mentioned once many years ago, I was learning in a small shul in the mornings after I got married. And the rub of that shul was a man by the name of Rabbi Vitzik. Rabbi Vitzik was a disciple of the Chavetz Chaim. He had learned by him in Radin. And my friend and I were learning, my friend Moshe Stubb and I were learning every morning, Hilchas Tshuva by the Rambam. So we were in a few days experts in the laws of tshuva. And Rabbi Vitzik came over to us and he asked us, what are you learning? We told him, Milchus Tshuva, Rabbi. He said, you really tell me what is the meaning of tshuva? So after three or four days of learning in depth the laws of tshuva, I proceeded to tell him tshuva means to return to Hashem. What a powerful answer that was to Rabbi Vitzik. And Rabbi Vitzik looked at me and he said, that's a nice definition, but that's not really what tshuva is. Tshuva is when you are creating a new world between you and Hashem. That means that every step that a person takes in the world of tshuva, every movement that they make in the direction that is going to bring them closer to Hashem, tshuva means yes to return. That means because we went far away and now we're coming back to the Rebbeinu Shailam, but it's not just a return, it is I'm creating a new world between me and Hashem. The old world was filled with perhaps sin. The old world was filled with maybe laziness, maybe despair. The old world was filled with things that did not find favor in the eyes of Hashem. And I'm now creating and designing and rebranding myself. So that when I go into the world and into the realm of the Rebbe Shalom's world and his presence, it's a new relationship. There are new ideas. It is fresh. It is exciting. As we mentioned the other night in the, in the Shia on Tefillah, there's a hischach, there's something that is, that is elevating and brand new about this bond, about this relationship that we have with Hashem. So tshuva, as we are hopefully going to see, it's not just charata, feeling bad for what we did. It's not just accepting upon ourselves that we'll never do it again and planning for the future. That's true. That's part of it. But if a, if a person is not trying to create a new environment and a new world and a new direction that they are taking, so then we are falling very short from tshuva. The Rambam in his magnum opus of halacha, he has an entire chapter that is devoted to the laws of tshuva. And smack in the middle, after he's already spoken about Yom Kippur, the tshuva, the tshuva of Elul, the tshuva of the shoifa, after all of that, he's described all the steps that a person goes through in order to do tshuva properly. Suddenly smack in the middle of all of these halachas, the Rambam begins to speak about his thesis on the concept and the topic of Bechira of free will. After four in-depth chapters where the Rambam describes every little detail and nuance of how to do tshuva, suddenly the Rambam gets to a point and he begins writing what the world of Bechira of free will is all about. And the Mephorshim on the Rambam are bothered Number one, why is the Rambam just over here beginning to speak about Bechir, about free will? And if there's something valuable about free will, so then what is the Rambam adding into the laws of tshuva that I didn't know already before? And it seems to me this is a halacha sefer. This is a book about halacha. If it's a book about halacha, so then why are you giving us theory and hashkafa and ideas when your job is just to tell us the facts. The facts are, if you did a sin, you have to do tshuva. The facts are that tshuva is charata, kabbalah ala asin, 
that you're never going to go back to it again. Vidui, you're going to have to course, you're going to have to give your confessional and your regrets to the Rebbein Shaivu. So what is the Rambam injecting over here? A beautiful understanding of the world of free will. What do we need to know about this in order to fulfill the myths of tshuva in the proper way? So the words of the Rambam are loosely based upon famous words of Chazal. Chazal tell us in the name of Rebbe Hanina, the Gemara tells us in three different places, the main places of this Maimah Chazal, the Gemara tells us the following idea. And that is that Rebbe Hanina, Oimeh Rebbe Hanina said, that Hakol B'yidei Shemaim, everything is in the hands of heaven. Chutz Mi'ira Shemaim, except for the fear of heaven itself. Everything is in the hands of Hashem. Chutz Mi'ira Shemaim, except that Hashem doesn't deal with the year, the fear, and the awe of Shemaim. That he apparently leaves up to us. How do we know that? Shemar, because it said in the Parsha, several weeks ago, the Ata Yisrael Ma'ashem Alokecha Shol Me'imach, and now, Klal Yisrael, what does Hashem want from you? Kim Le'yira, all that he wants is that you should fear Hashem. And when it says the Ata and now, that means it's not just now when they were in the wilderness, now when Moshe Ben is about to die, but the Ata right now, as we are sitting here tonight, as we are talking about these topics, what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu want from you? Only one thing. He wants Yir HaShemayim. He wants the fear of sin. Now Rashi, Kedarcha, Kedish, the way that he always deals with, with my Mari Chazal, when the Chazal says something in one Gemara, another Gemara, he rarely ever translates or explains that Gemara word for word the way that he does in a different Masech, a different tractate. And in three different places, Rashi says three different ideas on this Gemara. And perhaps if we're able to put them together in the right way, we'll have a very deep insight into tshuva and an understanding of why the Rambam himself spends so much time to explain how Bechira, how our free will works. Says Rashi, in the Gemara Megillah, Chutz Mi'ira Shemaim, everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. Oisa Mesor Bide Adam, that itself was given over to our hands. Shehum atzmai mechen libay lekach. So that we ourselves should prepare our hearts for the year of, for the fear. Again, if you don't want to call it fear because it makes you too scared. So we'll call it the reverence. We'll call it the awe. We'll call it the recognition of the Rebbeinu Shailam. What did HaKadosh Baruch Hu give us? He gave us the ability to prepare in our hearts this awe felt feelings that we have of Hashem. Says, the, says Rashi, even though that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has the ability himself to prepare our hearts to fear him, because Hashem can do anything like it says, like we're going to say on Yom Kippur itself, we are like the chaymer, we're like the clay in the hand of the yoytzer, in the hand of the potter. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu can manipulate and he can mold and he can shape our hearts. And we want us that, I want us to have Yerash Shemayim, he could place it inside of our hearts very easily. However, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided he doesn't want to give it over to us as a gift. He wants a person to develop inside of their own hearts something called Yira Shemaim, the fear and the reverence and the awe of the Rebbeinu Shemaim. That's one place that Rashi comments. Rashi then comments also in the Gemara in Nida. Now the Gemara in Nida says a little bit more about this idea of where the Yira Shemaim is coming from. Because the Gemara writes over here the following idea. <clears throat> the Gemara says, "The Dorish Rabbi Chanina Bar Papa, Rabbi Chanina Bar Papa said over the following: 
Oiso, Oiso, Malech, Hamamun, Al Hiriyoyen, Laila Shemai. There is a Malech, there is an angel. And this angel is appointed over conception and inception. And it says, From the moment of inception, this Malach, this angel, he takes the tipa, the one little seed of life, and he brings it before Hashem. And he says, This tipa, this drop, what is going to be with you? What is the future of this child's life going to be? Giba or Chalash, will he be strong? Will he be weak? Chacham or Tipesh, will he have a lot of brilliance and genius? Or will he be a Tipesh? Will he be, have a foolish mind? Asher or Ani, will he be rich or will he be poor? All of that, the Malach, the angel, asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what's going to be with this child? However, the Ilu Rasha Itzadik, Loika Omar. But whether or not this child is going to grow up to be righteous or wicked, that Loika Omar HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't make a single decision. How do we know that? Could Rebbe Hanina, like Rebbe Hanina himself says, the Omar Rebbe Hanina, Hako Bide Shemaim, Chutz Migira Shemaim. Everything is in the hands of heaven, except for the fear of heaven itself. Says the Gemara, what does that mean? That somehow means that your Yira Shemayim, if you have it, you have a chance of becoming righteous. If you don't have it, so then it's going to be not a life of righteousness. On the other hand, says the Gemara, it will most likely be a life of Rishus, of wickedness and turning away from Hashem. Says Rashi on this Gemara, the same Gemara basically that we said before. All of the Midas, all of the inherent character traits, the Kairosav and all of the events of a person's life. They all befall a person through the Gezerah, through the decree of the Melech of the King. Chutz Mizu, except for Yiras Shemayim. There is a Gezerah HaMelech, there is a, there is a decree that is coming up, coming down from Shemayim, from the heavens. And HaKadosh Baruch is deciding every little detail that's going to happen in your life. Who you're going to be, where you're going to come from, who your parents are going to be, what country you're going to live in, where you're going to be born. It's decreed already in the heavens who you're going to marry, who your children are going to be. There are divre nistarim, there are hidden words in the, in the mystics that even the neshamas of your children chose you as the parents and you the parents chose those neshamas as their, as your children before you came down to this world. The Nisyanis, there are even sources that say the Nisyanis, the challenges that you have in life. There was, there were, there were uh, I guess, choices and choosing that was going on in the heavens, what it's going to look like. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings every, everything down to this world against your will. It has nothing to do with you. It's all the Rebbe Nisyanis. Except for one thing Hashem says, that I've entrusted in your hand, it's called Yira Shemayim. Like it says in the Pasik, says Rashi, This is the only thing that HaKadosh Baruch asks of you. Because everything is in Hashem's hand, but this belongs to you. Everything in this world belongs to Hashem, except one thing, yours. What you have. What do you have? You don't have anything for yourself. Only one thing you can claim is yours. Yiras Shemayim. The fear of heaven. And yet Rashi still is, and, and therefore, so what? So you have Yiras Shemayim. So what's that supposed to do for a person? How's that supposed to change a person's life? Rashi still does not say. 
until we get into Gemara in Brachis. The Gemara says over here the same exact Gemara that we said before. And then Rashi says the famous words in this Gemara. Hakobi de Shemai. Kolabala Adam Biyara Kodesh Barachu. Everything that comes upon a person is from the hands of Hashem. Kagan Aruch Kotze, will he be tall or will he be short? Ani Asher, will he be poor, will he be rich? Chacham Shaita, will he be wise or foolish? Love and Shacha, white or black? It's all up. This is before critical race theory was even in the world. HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided already what a person is going to look like. And it's not a curse. It is what it is. That's the skin color, says Hashem. HaKol Bidei Shemayim. It's all in the hands of Hashem. Aval Tzadik V'Rasha, but like the Gemara said, righteous or wicked, Eino Ba'al Yidei Shemayim. That doesn't come through Hashem. This was given over into the hands of man. The Nasan Lefanov Shnei Drochim. HaKadosh Baruch has placed two pathways in front of you. Says Rashi, and you should choose the path of Yira Shemaim, the path of fear of Hashem. Rashi intimates in these final words over here that the understanding of Yira Shemaim is that with that, a person is going to exercise their Bechira, their free will in this world. And if, in fact, you will exercise your Bechira and you will use it for the right things in the right way, then what is HaKadosh Baruch going to do? You're going to take the path the road perhaps that is less traveled in this world, but it's going to be the high road of life. Because when a person lives a life that is infused with Yira Shemayim, when a person chooses right over wrong, when they choose Torah and mitzvahs over something that is not Torah and mitzvahs, when they make a decision, even though that it's hard for them to make because they know it's the right thing to do, so then a person has utilized the one gift that HaKadosh Baruch has given to us in this world. And that one gift that Hashem says, I don't own, you own that for yourself. Show me what you're going to do with it. How are you going to use the gift of Bechira? How are you going to use your free will to maneuver and to make up your mind? When you are confronted with dilemmas in your life, what choices, in fact, are you going to make? Will you take a path of Yir Hashemayim? Or will you not? Says the Rambam in Hilchas Tshuva, very much based on these words of the Gemara and of Rashi. Says the Rambam in Hilchas Tshuva that a person comes to the Yomim Noroyim or they come to any moment in their life where they recognize that they must have sinned, they did something wrong. So a person will ask themselves the following question. Did I really have a choice whether or not I wanted to do that sin or not? Because do we say that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world and he knows everything and he guides everything exactly the way that it is supposed to be? And therefore, whatever I do in my life, I have no control. HaKadosh Baruch has set the button, automatic pilot, I'm running through this world. Or do we say that, yes, it's true. Call me of all of my inherent traits and all of the activities in my life and all of the events in my life. It's true, it's all from Hashem. But what I'm going to do with that which HaKadosh Baruch has given me the way that I'm going to react and the way in which I'm going to behave and the way in which I'm going to make the decisions in my life, that is up to me. Says the Rambam, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu would have decided already from the beginning of time, who is going to be a tzaddik and who is going to be a Russia, then you would come to Rosh Hashanah and you'd stand before HaKadosh Baruch Hu, 
And you say to yourself, I don't understand. Why are you judging me, Hashem? Whatever I did this year, you already decreed it's going to be. You know I'm going to do this sin. You know I'm going to do that sin. You programmed me to be such a person. What do you want from me? I'm a lazy person. It's hard for me to get up in the morning and get out of bed and make it to show. What do you want from me? If you would have given me a little bit more energy, you would have made me one of these morning people. I'm a night owl. What could I do? If you would have just made me a morning person, I'd be able to wake up in the morning, roll out of bed and come to shul. But you made me a night owl. And so when this, the clock strikes 12, that's when my night begins. It's not my fault. It's your fault, Hashem. If it would be true that you gave me this mouth and I've got the gift of gab and I love to schmooze, I love to talk, so what could you expect from me, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when my mouth is running so many miles per hour every single day, what could you expect? Of course I'm going to say Lush and Haram. What do you want from me? You made me in such a way. I have an aversion to all of the halachas that I'm learning about the laws of Shabbos. What do you want from me, HaKadosh Baruch Hu? That's the way that you made me. So now it's before Rosh Hashanah. I know that HaKadosh Baruch has judged me in the entire year. I say, I have nothing to worry about. Whatever I did is because you made me in that way. And if you made me in that way, what do you expect from me? Says the Rambam, that's not the way to look at life. Because the Gemara tells us, Rashi tells us, it's true that Hashem might have created you in such a way, you're a lazy bum, that's true. It could be that you like to talk and Lashonah comes very easy to your mouth, it's true. It could be that you have difficulties in certain areas of halacha or in hashkafa. It's true. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave all of that to you as the Nisayin, as the challenge, in order to see how are you going to utilize your Bechira, your free will, and Yira Shemaim to decide, should I get out of bed in the morning or not get out of bed in the morning? Should I keep my mouth closed? or not keep my mouth closed? Should I listen to the words of Lashon Hara that are being spoken around me? Or should I do like the Gemara says, Hashem made our fingers like pegs so that we can stick them in our ears. We don't have to hear words of Lashon Hara. There's not a mitzvah on the other hand, it's an favor to hear the words of Lashon Hara. I'm in a heated moment with my spouse right now. And I'm ready to fly off the handle. And I can already feel the anger welling. It started down and down. It's coming up. It's like I can feel the veins in my neck beginning to pop. Am I going to control myself? Or am I going to let loose? Says the Rambam, if you control yourself in situations that Hashem has sent your way, if you are misgabra, you overcome the inertia of your body to do what is right in the eyes of Hashem. If you are valiant and you are courageous in the way in which you will keep HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Torah and his mitzvahs, so then any mitzvah that you do, the reward is coming straight to you because you earned it. And if we don't say that, if we say that Hashem knows everything and he's decreeing everything and you have no choice whether you'll be at Sandak or Russia, then guess what? you'll get no reward for a single mitzvah that you did. Then we're really in trouble on Rosh Hashanah. We have nothing at all to show for ourselves. But since then, there's something called Bechira, there's something called free will, I decide and I choose in my life to do whatever it is that I want. So when it comes to the days of Elul and it comes to Rosh Hashanah, and I know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is judging my actions. If I did an Avera, I did something that is wrong, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, guess what? You're responsible for that. And therefore, says the Rambam, that's why all of the Torah is filled with HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanding his people and then the Moshe Rabbeinu commanding the people and the Nevi'im, the prophets commanding the people, do tshuva and abandon your ways. Why? Because if we did something wrong, we put ourselves into that direction. Nobody put us in that direction besides who we are. 
And this really is what we said in the Parsha last week. The Parsha has, in the very beginning, has several mitzvahs. And the, it, or several, I guess we'll call them averis. The Parsha begins in last week's Parsha, Kiseitze, Kiseitze in the Melchamu, you go out to battle. And there you are in the throes of war, and you see this beautiful Yafas Tayar, this maiden, and you cannot control your urges. You want to take her as a wife. So the Torah says, okay, we realize that you cannot control yourself. So you know what? Says the Torah, will be Mata will permit you to take her as a wife. And you have to go through a whole process over there. You bring her to the house, you shave her down, she grows the nails, she sits in sackcloth, she cries, she's got beady red eyes and puffy eyes, mucus dripping all down her. And you keep tripping over every time you walk in and out of the house. And the Rosh says, why are you doing that? What's she doing over there? So that you'll trip over and you'll say, this is what a non-Jewish woman looks like. Think about cloud yourselves, women. Think about how wonderful they are. And maybe you'll hold yourself back. But even if you don't, the Torah says, you can marry her. But then right after that, it speaks about the, the Isha Sanua. Sanua, it speaks about the woman that you hate, your wife that you hate, and all the terrible things that will come as a result of that. And then it speaks about the Ben Saira Umaira, which is the wayward son. So Rashi wants to know what's the connection? You go out to battle, you find a beautiful woman, you take her as a wife. After that, you end up having a wife that you hate. And after that, you end up having a son who's a wayward child. What's the connection of these three things together? Thor doesn't just put things uh, uh, just by accident next to each other. It says Rashi. Avalim Nasif, you marry this woman that you really shouldn't, but the Torah said you could. At the end, you'll come to hate her. Like it says afterwards, when a man will have a wife that he despises. And at the end of all of that, you'll end up giving birth to a wayward son. Therefore, these parshas are all connected to each other. Says Rashi, the path that you are going to go in in life is the path that you are choosing for yourself. And when you start the slippery slope of Avera, so Avera, Goireres, Avera, one sin will lead to another one. It will almost be at that point, it's like out of your control. Like the Gemara says, if a person was a person was Avar, they sinned, and then Shadabah, they did it again. Says the Gemara, Nasa like a head there, it becomes in your eyes like it's permissible to do such a thing. Permissible, asked the Gemara. It's permissible to do it. It's only in your eyes. It seems to be permissible, but of course it's not. Meaning once that I convince myself that the actions that I'm doing, which are, are wrong, I think in my mind there's nothing so bad about it, then it just goes on like a cycle, one thing after the other. However, the Torah says for later on, it says, Ki sivna bayis, uh, it talks about the Mr. Shiluach HaKen, of you find the mother bird in the nest, you take her out of the nest, you take the, the birds that are there, shoot the mother bird away, and you did a mitzvah. Let's not go into details what is this mitzvah, but it's a small mitzvah. Then the Pasuk says, and then you'll build yourself a new house. And since the, they used to do a lot of work on the roofs of those homes, there was a mitzvah to build a marker, to build a, a fence along the, top of the, uh, along the top of the house. Then after that, it says, Then it says that if you have a vineyard, now you're, you're a big shot, you have a vineyard. Imagine, Bob, your own vineyard, your own winery. You have a vineyard now. So now you have to not have plant it in the right way. You can't plant grapes and barley together or wheat together. You can't do such things. And then you have a field. And you want to go plow the field. You have a shore. You have a chamor. You have an ox and a donkey. You can't plow them together. Those silver shotness, you have a nice suit that you got for the young Narayim. Better make sure there's no shotness, no wool and linen inside of there. Says Rashi, what's the connection? Shiluach haken, you go start with the, with the mother bird. Then you build yourself a new house. Then you have the fence that you're building on the top. Then you come to the vineyard and then from the vineyard to the field and from the field to your new clothing. What's the connection? Im kayemes mitzvah shiluach hakan. 
if you fulfill the mitzvah of shooing the mother bird away. In the end, you'll come to build a brand new house. And you'll be able to build a fence around the, around the, uh, the roof. Because one mitzvah will lead to another mitzvah. And that'll bring you to a vineyard and then to a field and then to beautiful clothing. That's why all of these parshas are together. Says Rashi in the Torah, a very simple idea. Which direction are you heading in? You will decide for yourself. You will set up the pathways that you are taking. If in fact a person is doing mitzvahs, so then one mitzvah will lead to another, like the Vilna Gain says on this idea, that every time that a person does a mitzvah, he creates like a ruach of kedusha that is enveloping him. And from when that one ruach of kedusha, there's like a, a thirst that the neshama has and wants more and more and more and more. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want to deny the neshama its thirst. He doesn't want to diss the neshama to the side over here and say, figure it out for yourself. So you know what HaKadosh Baruch Hu does? He makes it easier for you. And he sets up in your pathway many opportunities for mitzvah so that you can develop the neshama that you have inside. But the Vilna Gaon says the same thing is true with the Ruach Hatuma, the spirits of impurity. When you end up getting this Ruach of Tuma, these impure feelings that are all around you, what happens is it's insatiable. It wants more and more and more and more and more. And therefore, Hashem says, you want? As we know the famous words in the Gemara. The Gemara says, Habo letahir Messiah loy. Somebody who comes to purify themselves, Messiah in loy, Hashem is going to help them. Habo letame, but somebody who comes to impurify themselves, Paischin loy, all of the gateways of Tuma will open up in front of him. You could have a person there from, as, as the Sefer Achinuch writes, how scary it is, as he writes over there the famous words of all the Nifla people lost of. A person is defined by their actions. The actions that I do define who I am as a person. And therefore he writes, you could have the biggest Russia in the world. And one day he decides, you know what? Hashem is around the corner. I heard there's an idea to give tzedakah. Maybe I should get stuck today. So lo and behold, he gets a knock on the door. There's a poor man standing there and says, please, sir, it's been such a rough year, COVID. I haven't been to America in two years. Please help me out. And he says, look at that. I wanted to give tzedakah in my door. Bangs right now, there's tzedakah. He pulls out his checkbook and he writes a big fat check for $7. And he hands it to him. He just did an act of tzedakah. A person is defined by their actions. He said, that feels pretty good. I wish I could give more. Another knock at the door. He writes a bigger check, $18. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. Says the Sefer, the biggest rush in the world could transform himself into the most righteous man around. But frighteningly, the opposite is true as well. You could have a person, tzaddik, yisayid, oilam, a righteous individual foundation of this world. They're doing everything in the right way. They're davening, they're learning with kedusha and ruach and everything. But one day, they decide for one reason or another to do an avera. And they do that avera and they get the taste of sin in their mouth. Tastes pretty good, sin. So he goes back the next day for a, a bigger taste, a bigger serving. And the next day, another platter and another portion. Says the Sefer Achinuch, you could have a person that was a tzaddik gomor, a completely righteous individual. But since that Adam nifa pipuloisov, since that a person is defined by their actions, if he keeps doing the wrong one again and again and again, he could sink into the oblivion of tomb of impurity. 
when a person comes to purify themselves, Messiah, they are helped. HaKadosh Baruch will help them, the Malachi will help them, Mitzvahs will help them, there'll be people along the road, they'll find <coughs> sign, road signs that will help them along the way to get to where they want to go. You're coming to purify yourself. It opens up, it's so easy to go down. A parable, to what is it comparable? I'm sure that anybody, everybody here has been on roller coasters before. And if you've been on any of those very tall roller coasters with 300 foot drops, you know that as the cart is going up and up and up, it's going slow, slow, slow. And you can hear every crank and crank and crank and crank that is there. And everybody's getting nervous because they know that once it gets to the top, that's it, it's going down. But it's going so slow, cranking, 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 and then you get to the top. And that's when you hear the crank release. And when that crank releases, you know exactly what's coming next. The roller goes straight down, and that's when everybody starts screaming. That's what Chazal are telling us. Habo, Letaya, when you're coming to purify yourself, to climb the mountain, it goes slow, and it's one crank after another, but it's Messiah Lloyd. Hashem is going to help you. Habo, Letaya, when you want to go down, the crank releases, and the car just goes shh shooting down and that's for all the screaming and the yelling and the fright and the trepidation and the excitement, that's where it comes from. What is tshuva? Why are we obligated to do tshuva, says the Rambam, you know why? Because if you have done something wrong in your life, you chose to do something wrong in your life. If your path is going in this crooked direction like that, you, have chosen that direction. Because the only thing you can blame on the Rebbein Shalom is kol midoisa v'karoisa v'gzeres hamelech, who you are, the midois that are inherent in you, the scenarios and the events that are happening in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the challenges, the successes, the failures, and the achievements, all of that, it's up to him. Nothing to do with you at all. That's why the Pasuk says that a rich man should not gloat over his ashiris, over his richness. Because if you're a rich man, Hashem decided you're a rich man. And the poor man should not wallow away in his misery over his poverty because Hashem decided. That's how it's going to be. Well, think about COVID for one minute. There are people that made a killing in the last two years in their business. They made business that in their wildest dreams, they never cholim, they never dreamed such business would ever come up. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. Because they found something that the world needed. And so they sold again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And they're rolling in the dome. And there's people during COVID, they closed their doors. They couldn't keep up with their lease. They begged the landlord one month, another month, another month, another month, another month. They tried to keep on to the employees. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you next month. Trust me, I'll pay you next month. And the business falls. That's HaKadosh Baruch Hu's decision. The one who became rich, that's Hashem. The one who became poor, that's Hashem. But the one during COVID, COVID the one during COVID, <clears throat> that's the Yeshivish way to say COVID, yeah. The one during COVID, who allowed his amuna and his bitachin to waver. The one during COVID who didn't take advantage of all of the hours that they didn't have to go to work and they were able to learn a little bit more and dive in with more kavana and spend more time. Some people told me to their credit that those few months that the shuls were closed were some of the best tefillahs of their entire life because they said they weren't by a schedule, they didn't have to wake up exactly crack of dawn to make it to Makar, Chaim, and Davin. They were able to get the sleep they needed, and then they could go off into a room by themselves and Davin at their own pace, at their own speed, with their own words, with their own kavanas. And they said some of them got so close through COVID to the, to the rebundish of the Davining. So then they were able to utilize the situation that Hashem put us into 
and they utilize it with their free will, their Bechira and their Yerah Shemayim, they utilize it for the right reasons. The obligation of a Jew to do tshuva, says the Rambam, is because we have chosen our destiny. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not decide it for us. We have become the person that we are because we made decisions in our life that put us in that direction. If you are proud of where you're holding in your Yiddishkeit, you can pat yourself on the back because you made courageous and valiant decisions in your life to get you to the place that you are today. And that's why the Ramam says, you deserve to be rewarded. But if a person feels that they're lacking and that they're missing and they could be better and they could be greater and they could do more. So the only person to blame is the person themselves. Because that means that the decisions that I've been making or not making in my life, they led me to this place where I am today. And therefore, tshuva is the recognition that whatever I have done wrong this year is because I did it to myself. And HaKadosh Baruch I would like to create a new world with you. It's a world where I elevate my power of free will and I use my choices for the right thing. I am confronted by a crossroads. I'm confronted by different, differing opinions. I'm confronted by a difficulty, by a challenge by tribulations, and I dig in to the world of Bechir, to my free will, and I will, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, try harder this year to make the right decision. It means I can't be so impulsive. I cannot be so emotional. I cannot be so weak. David HaMelech was Melech of Klal Yisrael, and he would find himself often in the presence of other kings of the world, and David says, I never was embarrassed once to speak about the words of your Torah Hashem. The other kings are speaking about the conquest and what they conquered in this, this town, in this village, in this country, this kingdom, all their gold and silver. It doesn't bother me, HaKadosh Baruch I don't care about it. I got into the big meeting of the kings. I told them the Dvar Torah on the Parsha. Takes courage, takes inner strength. But that's what we're showing our Kodesh Baruch Hu this time during Elul and on Rosh Hashanah. We're showing the Rebbeinu Shailam. I recognize that the only thing that I have to offer you that I can accomplish on my own is Yira Shemayim, and that will lead me to Yira Shait, the fear and the awe of doing sin as well. And therefore, Hashem, I'm going to try my best this up and coming year to capitalize on being a person who is in tune with the power of Bechira so I can make the right choices, not fall into the trap of sin, and be better in tough shin, pay vase than I was in tough shin, pay olive. I want to leave you off with a mindset just that we should understand the power of one's actions, the power of one's thoughts, what a person could really accomplish if they'll just allow themselves to do the right things and use the Bechir properly. Many years ago, there was a tzaddik who lived in this world. His name was Rav Shlomo Halbishtam. He was the Bob of a Rebbe. He, he, he came, I think he came, if I'm not mistaken, even before the war. And he built a beautiful Hasidus of Bob of Hasidim in New York. And he had a big base midrash today, this, this gigantic Bati Midrashim in Borough Park. And he was a tzaddik. Anybody ever saw a picture of his face? I never saw him in person, but the sweetness and the smile and the warmth and the avas Yisrael that he exuded. So he was walking one Shabbos morning with his younger son. They walked through a park to get to the base midrash to go and daven. And as they're walking, there's a yid sitting on a park bench smoking a cigarette. And the Rebbe looks at the Yid and he says, Asham Aleichem Rebbe Yid. And the Yid answers back, Aleichem Hashalom Rebbe. 
And the two of them begin having a conversation. And the conversation goes on and it turns out that this, the Rebbe knew this man's family, he knew which town he was from. And the man intimates to the Rebbe in the course of the conversation that he used to be the chazan in the main shul in the town where he came from. So the Rebbe says, unbelievable. You're a chazan. And in our base midrash, we need a chazan. He said, why don't you come with me and my son right now to the shul, to the yeshiva, and you be the chazan for Shabbos for the base midrash. So the man says, Rebbe, maybe you don't see what's going on over here. It's Shabbos and I'm smoking a cigarette. I don't keep Shabbos. I smoke cigarettes. I drive in cars. I don't even keep kosher anymore. How in the world could I be the chazan in your base midrash? The Rebbe said, no, you don't understand. We need you. We don't have a chazan. We need somebody. Back and forth, back and forth. And the man says, Rebbe, I'm not coming. Okay, fine. A good Shabbos to you. And the Rebbe and his son walk away. And the Rebbe's son says, Kati, how could you ask a Machal Shabbos, someone who's desecrating Shabbos in front of your face, how could you ask them to be the Chazan in the Shul? So the Rebbe answered so insightfully, it's not the Yid that's smoking a cigarette. It's the Nazi Gestapo that beat him all those years that's forcing him to smoke the cigarette. It's not him. You can't understand what he went through. The next week, they walk to the park. Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem, Rebbe. They talk. The guy's smoking his cigarette, still going on and on. Come, come, come. We need a chazan. Please come. Rebbe, I'm smoking. I'm not, I'm not, I don't keep shabbos. I'm not coming. And it goes on like this week after week after the Rebbe doesn't let up on this man. And finally, after who knows how many weeks, he's all right, fine, I'll come. I'll be the chazan. And sure enough, the Rebbe walks in. You have to imagine the scene. You're talking about one of the premier chasidus in America at the time. Large base midrash. The Rebbe walks in with a man that I assume everybody knew who he was and what he was doing. And the Rebbe tells him, no, 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 no. Davin, Davin. Go Davin for us. And the chazan ends up leading beautiful davening. The next week he says, you know, I'm the chazan in the bubble base measures. Probably I shouldn't smoke cigarettes anymore on Shabbos. And then he says, maybe I should start keeping kosher. And maybe I should put on some tzitzis and a yarmulke and v'chule, v'chule, v'chule. And over the short amount of time, this man became a true Baal Tshuva. Eventually he got married, started raising the family. And he and his wife decided out of Borough Park to move, and they moved somewhere into the suburbs. And they kept up sporadic communication with the Rebbe. About 20, 25 years later, the Rebbe gets an invitation to a chasana. And it says, the, chvoid, the, Zayd, the Rebbe, our Zayda, please come to the chasana. And he's looking at the name, who is this? I don't recognize. And then he recalls, oh, that yid from the park bench. He must be wearing off his child. Amazing. And the family called the Rebbe, are you coming? He said, I can't come that night. For one reason or another, Rebbe was not able to come. He said, I'm so sorry. We'd love that I can't come. He said, Rebbe, we're going to make a Sheva Brachas in Borough Park. We're going to rent out a hall. We're going to ask you to come. You must come to be Mechabinus. We need to have you there. The Rebbe said, you do that, fine. I'll be there, no problem. Sure enough, the chasana takes place, and after the wedding comes Sheva Brachas, and the night of the Sheva Brachas in Borough Park comes, and the Rebbe walks in. And as the Rebbe walks in, he is confronted by perhaps eight of the children of this man. And they're all saying, Zayda, 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 you're the Zayda. Because of the way that you showed your love to our father, and you allowed our father to make the right decisions and start coming back and be chayza b'tshuva. That's why all of us are standing here today. And Adam is nifal our people who loisav. You do the right things, you hang around the right people, you go to the right places, so you make something of yourself. 
But if you hang around the wrong people in the wrong places, doing the wrong things, Oiva voice says the Gemara, what's going to be with such a person? The days of Elul right before Rosh Hashanah are the moments of the year where a person begins to evaluate the steps that we took in the previous year and also to evaluate for ourselves which direction are we planning to move in in the up and coming year. If we find something that is not appropriate, we find something that is wrong, we created that and we did that on our own and therefore requires children. If you find good and you find things that you did that were courageous with Mesir's nefesh, you're allowed to pat yourself on the back. It's a schus that you have, I think, Rabbi Morgan Zatzal used to tell the men of Ishir every year before Rosh Hashanah, you have to bring in your notebook of all of your notes, of all the pages that we learned together. And it could be at the time you only learned about six lines of Gemara, but you had a notebook that was this thick filled with notes. Because he said, when you come on Rosh Hashanah and you want HaKadosh Baruch to judge you for why you deserve another year of life, you should show him what it is that you have to offer. A person who did good things this year, you have what to offer HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Don't be embarrassed about them. You're not gloating about it. You're just showing HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I know how to use my Bechira, my free will in the right way. Things that we did wrong, we have to fix those up to the best of our abilities. If we do that, so then through our free will and through the choices that we're making, we begin to create an Olam Chadash, a brand new world. As Rav Wolba writes in the Ali Shur, by the time that Rosh Hashanah is over and you were mechazik, you strengthen yourself in these ideas again and again and again, and you acted on your best behavior and you tried to be that tzaddik or tzaddik as you want to be for two days straight, we're supposed to emerge from Rosh Hashanah as a Bria Chadasha, as a brand new entity, as a new creation a person who has a new world together with Hashem. Hashem should give us the strength to be honest with ourselves. He should give us the strength to dig in to our neshamas and see the kaychas, the potential that is untapped, that is really in there. He should give us the courage to make the proper decisions in situations when it's not always so easy to make the right decision. And in that Zechus and Yitz Hashem, we begin the process of tshuva starting today. You don't wait till Rosh Hashanah. Because anyway, Rosh Hashanah, there's no tshuva on Rosh Hashanah. One of the wonders of Rosh Hashanah, the day that HaKadosh Baruch is judging us, there's not a mention of tshuva in the 800 pages of the Machsa. We don't do al we don't do vidu, we don't confess, we don't bemoan our sins, nothing at all in the Machsa about Tshuva at all. Why not? You'll have to come next week to the class to find out. But in the meantime, what it teaches us is, is that the only, the time for us to start doing the tshuva is today. And if we do that, we'll create this beautiful world, like Ravitzik said, this beautiful new world with Hashem, and that itself will be the greatest schus that we can have as we are signed and sealed in the book of life, not just life, but the good and the sweet life that is Hashem. Amen.